Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here today and coming out after the replay party and sticking out until Friday. You guys rock, so thanks for being here with us. Today, we're going to talk about optimizing storage for media use cases. I'm joined by David Andrade of Theory Studios, and he's going to tell his story about how they actually migrated for workloads on the cloud, um, for their workloads on cloud. And they delivered shots for Amazon's series, Man in the High Castle. So again, thank you all for being here this morning. Today we're going to cover AWS storage, specifically how it fits into media and entertainment workloads. We're going to talk about storage services and how they align to workloads on us, what we see customers adopting the cloud for in this space. So I'm an enterprise solutions architect, and in architecture at AWS, we have too many services, or just so many services. So what we do as an architect is we choose a few that we want to go deep on. So for me, I, I love cloud, I love media on cloud, so I, I work with the media teams and also storage teams, and it allows for some fun collaborations to do things like this, talk about storage for media. And one of my favorite things about what the cloud allows our customers to do is to really level the playing field. So Theory Studios is not a large company, but they have access to the same technology as the huge studios do out there. And it's just, it's really, really nice. AWS provides a complete set of building blocks for our customers to leverage. We have three main technologies for storage. So Block, and that's through Amazon EBS and the Amazon Instant Store on EC2. File, which is delivered over EFS. So that's a file system across the entire region. And Object Store through Amazon S3 and Glacier. We also provide ways to move data into and out of the cloud. So for example, with AWS Storage Gateway, you can have a download a virtual appliance that runs on-prem, and we can expose cloud storage offerings in three ways. One is through File Gateway. So we export a file system, and you drag and drop files onto the gateway, and it appears on, the, on S3 as a one-to-one -one map. There's also tools such as Amazon Kinesis Streams for Video, which we just recently announced and the AWS Snow family, which I'll go into. Today, we're going to focus on EBS and also other technologies, or sorry, EBS, and how, um, how Theory uses this in their workloads. When we first started seeing media customers adopt the cloud, they started in areas such as OTT and storage, just for maybe for archive. And since then, we've seen customers adopt seven substantial segments on the cloud, such as content acquisition, supply chain management, OTT for playout, post-production workloads, and a digital asset management and archive. When we overlay these seven workloads with storage technologies, we see some consistencies across S3, is across many of these, cloud front for playout and distribution, and also in ingress, which I'll cover. And there's you know, just basically technologies that span across all these, and you can choose what's really best for you. When we overlay this same technology, these same seven segments with media segments, or sorry, with um, our customers, we have customers such as Discovery Communications for Playout, Hulu, Netflix, um, MLBAM on OTT, and post-production companies like Sony, FuseFX, and Theory Studios. And there's some, some challenges that run into with media. This includes things like content growth. 4K has been become a standard for delivery, but typically working sets are 8K or larger, depending on what assets are being worked on. And it may be also used for compositing, so they're rendering larger frames. So in post, you can do scaling easily and cleanly. Peak demand. So customers have to traditionally scale up their infrastructure to handle peak demand. And in most cases, as, um, as many as you know, I'm sure, for media, it's everything like, we need this right now, hurry up, we have more shots to deliver, or maybe something didn't work well than the render, they have to re-render everything, so please like, get this out the door now. And that's kind of hard to do on-prem. Competitive pressures. 
customers keep raising the bar with technology and with the content quality out there. So as all these shows keep really getting incredibly better on visual effects and production quality, it really raises the bar of what's possible here. And finally, customers should be focusing on their core competency, which probably is creating content and not managing data centers and figuring out render farms and scaling network and storage to handle these demands. At AWS, we have a very vast ME ecosystem, ranging across all these pillars of ingest, tools such as Aspera, networking companies like SohoNet, storage like Avere and Cumulo. And many of these companies worked pre-cloud and they're aware of all the production workloads that have to occur on cloud. So some of the trends, I mentioned 4K and 8K for processing, and the Coffin report from Coffin Associates says that between 2014 to 2020, we expect about a 4.9 time increase in the required digital capacity for storage in the m and &E industry. So that really ranges from about 18,000 petabytes up to 66,000 petabytes. So scale, I mean, storage is nonstop here, just keeps growing and growing. AWS has a very mature marketplace, which allows our customers to go and launch products from a marketplace in a one-click deploy scenario. And what's really great to see are many of these companies that are in the marketplace are enabling licensing models that support the cloud. Traditionally, licensing models may be, you know, you have to buy a license for one year, and then that's tied to a physical device. The new way of doing things is pay-as-you-go licensing. So when you're using the software, when you use the services, you pay for the license, and when you're not, you don't pay for the license. And it really allows your customers to enable and take advantage of the elasticity of the cloud. Some other considerations around distance and content gravity. We see customers that have production, let's say, in London, they're producing the film there, and they're doing post-production in California. So we see customers either write data to the London region and then copy data over to the California region to do post-production. And you can leverage tools with S3, such as S3 um, cross-region replication to accomplish these goals. And of course, cost. You can select the right storage solutions for your workloads, and we're gonna go into some details on this. So each, um, each solution is different, and you can choose what's really best for you. A quick look at the areas AWS computes today. So we have 16 regions, and a region is the area where we have data centers and availability zones and export our services for consumption, and 44 availability zones. And we have plans for 17 more availability zones and six more regions coming. So this is gonna be a high-level summary. That theory is gonna provide more information on their story about how they, how they did this. But it's super high-level simplified. You're ingesting data, you're storing data, you edit or manipulate and process. With ingestion, we see customers leverage tools such as the AWS Snow family. So with this, it includes technologies and products such as AWS Snowball and Snowmobile. The Storage Gateway family I mentioned earlier. Storage Gateway, one of my favorites is File Gateway. So it's a one-to-one -one map of files on-prem to objects in S3. AWS Direct Connect, which is a fiber offering that connects the border of the AWS cloud to the border of your network. We're deployed in many data centers globally for Direct Connect. And if you're not in the same data center as the Direct Connect POP, that's no problem. We have many solutions partners that work with us, such as CenturyLink Level 3, SohoNet, Zio, Zio, all these places. And S3 Transfer Acceleration. So we have several POPs globally for our CloudFront CDN. And S3 Transfer Acceleration allows us to leverage our POPs and our backbone capacity to upload data to S3 and you ingest through the closest POP to you. So you really see tool, you see um, great performance increases over long distances. So a quick look at Snowball. This is the 100 terabyte version. We have 50, 80, and 100 terabyte versions of the Snowball. 
And the Snowball is really great for things such as shipping data from on-premises, let's say an on-set location. You can write data down to Snowball and then drop it off at shipping and it comes to an S3 region for you. For us tech guys in the back of the Snowball, we have some connectivity options. So RJ45, it's copper, it is one gig and 10 gig. We have SFP Plus for 10 gig and QSFP, which is 40 gigabit. I recently brought this with me from LAX to Miami for a meeting and I checked it on the plane as luggage and I was kind of afraid. I mean, it's a ruggedized case, it's really made to handle substantial impact, but still, it was really awkward for me to bring 100 terabytes with me and check it in and just have the baggage handlers hopefully not beat it up. So I talked to the Snowball guys before doing this. I'm like, hey, are you guys sure this is okay for me to do? Am I gonna be safe for my meeting with the Snowball? And they said, look, people abuse this even with shipping. It falls off trucks, you can throw it, it's completely fine. And sure enough, um, it arrived in Miami, no problem, and it just worked. We have a, a Kindle built into it, and what's beneficial here is the shipping address is always gonna be correct. So when you plug it in, when you first receive it, it has your address, that you, that, you know, your, your shipping address. And as soon as you power it up, the logo changes, or the shipping label changes to be our address. So all you do is you drop it off at UPS, comes back to us, and life is good. For data storage, Amazon S3 is realistically the media data lake in the central, of, um, central hub of many of these workloads. S3 has multiple classes of storage. <clears throat> S3 standard is really designed for active reading, like you're reading files actively out of it often. S3 infrequent access, or IA, is really designed for nearline storage, but has the same performance characteristics as S3 standard. <clears throat> However, it's priced in a way that's designed to have data online, but just not frequently accessed as often as standard. And you can tier data down to Amazon Glacier, which is really designed for a long-term archive, and it's priced at a very affordable cost of 0.4 cents, or 4 tenths of a cent per gig per month. You can use lifecycle policies to move data either based on age, or you can move data based on, the, uh, on a condition match. So for example, anything that has a .dpx, automatically move that down to um, infrequent access, um, you can have policies that move things within a folder or so in S3 that matches a, a prefix. So maybe you load data in, and once you transcode data, you can write the finals out somewhere else and then move the high res down so you're not paying for the high res that you don't need actively. And all tiers are accessible through a single API. So for frequently accessed, this will live on S3. Nearline on IA, and long-term archive down in Glacier. There's a, a really nice feature of Glacier called Vault Lock, and Vault Lock was really developed for other, other industries that needed compliance and um, read-only access, and the ability to lock down content on Glacier so it can never be deleted for a, a, time, of, um, a time you dictate. And we found, entertainment companies adopting Vault Lock for maybe master assets or as they move data from on-site tape or archive to the cloud, they can guarantee that even if you're a root user on the main account, you cannot delete this content. So it protects against maybe a rogue user or um, some malicious activity. Glacier supports bulk or exp expedited retrieval. So depending on how quickly you need your data back, you can choose how fast you want it back, and then the billing is associated with how quickly you pull data back. But it makes things really easy. So if I need this asset immediately, you do bulk, or sorry, do um, expedited. But if you say, hey, you know, I need this back, it doesn't have to happen right now, I don't want to pay a lot for it, you can do the, um, the bulk retrieval. And one of the great things about the cloud and S3 is audit logging. So as you do more sensitive workloads on the cloud, maybe work with other vendors, you can easily audit who has access, who actually uploaded this file, who read this file, and to get complete auditability immediately. And customers take data from S3 and they pull it out to block storage, such as EC2 Instant Store or EBS. 
So often I'm asked, what is Instant Store compared to EBS, and when do I use one over the other? So Instant Store are the physical disks inside the hardware that's running your instance. These are um, either NVMe SSD backed volumes, SSDs, or HDD. It's non-persistent and it's ephemeral. So what that means is if you destroy the instance, if you terminate the instance, or the instance fails, the data associated with these volumes is going to be gone. It's not replicated by default. However, we see customers that replicate data using maybe third-party tools for backup. You can backup to other volumes or S3. And there's no snapshot support. With EBS, it's persistent block storage. And it's tied to a specific availability zone. It provides point-in-time snapshot support. And it's decoupled from the instance, meaning it's not associated inside the physical instance. So we see customers that have uh, EBS volume either for boot or for data or both, and they can change the size of the instance based on their needs. So if they want to do um, data processing, they can easily size up the instance, process data, and then change the instance type and lower it back down, and there's no problem there. It's also SSD or HDD backed, and you can modify the volume types as need change, and I'm going to go into that. We have four modern family types of EBS. On the SSD back, we have IO1 and GP2. IO1 is the highest performance EBS volume we have, and it provides a consistent baseline of performance at 99.9%. And GP2 is our general purpose workhorse for EBS. So it's our SSD backed volume, and really this is the volume that fits in nearly all workloads we see out there. In HDD backed volumes, we have the ST1 and SC1. The HDD-backed volumes are designed for sequential block workloads, such as media transcode, Cassandra commit logs, backup targets. And pricing is, as of today, pricing is current um, out of the US East One region. Well, how about choosing one? You have four, you have four volumes. So like, how, do you, how do you choose which type you want to use for your workloads? Here's a little matrix that we made to show how you decide. So if you need more than 80,000 IOPS and less than a millisecond of latency or single digit millisecond latency, look at instance stores, such as the i3 instance. So i3 has NVMe disks or technology. It has 3.3 million IOPS on a single i3 instance. And if you need throughput, if you need more than 1,700 megabytes a second of throughput, look at the D2 or other instance types that have, um, have many disks inside. But if, if your workload fits within the range inside there, which many do, there's options for EBS here. And one of my favorite releases that we put out this year for EBS is called EBS Elastic Volumes. So EBS Elastic Volumes allows you to change the volume type on the fly. You can do this in production without taking downtime, and there's no deg degraded performance to your application during this time. And I mean, for me, this hits home because I can not have to worry about taking applications down, working late hours, doing things over the weekend. I can spend time at home with my family and not take, you know, not work on the application. And it's just pretty great. It also allows you to size things correctly. So you can start small with the block volume. And as you need more space, you can either publish a metric to CloudWatch and automatically change the volume type, or you can do it by hand as well. So it's really easy to, to do this on the fly and size things correctly. So that was block storage. With file storage, we have Amazon EFS, or Elastic File System. And EFS is designed for petabyte scale, and the throughput of EFS scales linearly. And what's really great with EFS is it's across the entire region. So if you write a file in one availability zone, it's immediately consistent across all other availability zones for all attached hosts. It's really easy to scale as well. So you can attach, I mean, it's designed for thousands of instances to attach with, um, with NFS. And with S3, S3 is object store. So quick, high level on object store. It's not a file system. You can't mount it and browse um, like traditional file systems. It's accessed through a put, get, and delete. And it's very scalable for throughput as well. And one of the nice features of, of S3 is it has 11 nines of durability. So it's very durable in the region. And it's region-wide. 
And we see customers leveraging hybrid solutions as well. So if, for example, if you on the right side is your data center or your office, and let's say you have your existing render farm on site, you have storage on site already, but you want to burst to the cloud. We see customers using tools such as Avere and Cumulo on the cloud for VFX type workloads. Customers also use technology such as Snowball to ship data to the cloud for processing on cloud, and Snowball can send data back out as well. So you write, and when you're done, you can say, ship me all this data from S3 back into Snowball to my office. That could be great for disaster recovery or just moving data in or out of the cloud. And also, Direct Connect enables access to Elastic File System as well. So you can have your NFS file system on the cloud also be exported across Direct Connect to your host on-prem. So there's many ways we see customers leveraging both sides of this. For processing, there's really three ways to purchase compute. There's on-demand, where you pay for compute by the second with a one-minute minimum. Reserved instances, where if you know your, um, your capacity, you can buy a bulk of or, you know, either one instance or many instances at a discounted rate for a, a committed time. Or spot. So with spot, you bid on excess capacity at about you know, up to a 90% discount off the on-demand pricing. Realistically, we see customers leverage all three. If they know their baseline, they can purchase reserved instances and then use spot for burrs. Or use spot for many things. We see customers only use spot in some cases. And security is the most important thing for AWS. And it's, in the media industry, one of the most important things for content creators and post production houses as well. The content has to be secure. We align with MPAA-based, cloud-based application guidelines. We had a talk this week by Disney and Marvel talking about how to comply on the cloud for security. We support tools for encryption and key management to make this all very, very easy. So in a prior life, when we had to be audited by these companies, like, okay, do you do encryption at rest? Well, how do you do this easily on the cloud, right? Encryption in flight. This is literally a checkbox for EBS. You checkbox, encrypted, and it's done. There's no penalty for overhead, for CPU, or anything like that. It's just completely handled for you. Same with S3. It's very, very easy to accomplish this on us. Well, how about capacity planning? In the old world, you had to negotiate with vendors. And I don't know about you, but I would get calls every quarter like, hey, it's the end of the quarter, let's do a deal and get this job done. And I kind of felt a little bit hurt because like, well, where was that deal last time I bought all this from you? I didn't get that same special sweetheart deal. Um, you provision for peak storage requirements. And you have to manage the life cycle of your storage infrastructure, whether that's aging, um, SAN, NAS equipment, or even LTO. And you typically waste space on the hard drives or the capacity that you purchase based on what's usable. So for a quick look at that, let's say you have a petabyte of raw that's on disk space. Once rating is done, let's just, you know, for easy math, you're at 800 terabytes formatted capacity. You don't want to have your users use a 100% of that, so let's just say you allocate 600 terabytes out to the company to use for production content. However, what if your data set maybe initially is only 400 terabytes? You have all this overhead that's not being utilized and you're paying to power and cool it and it's just not the best scenario. So in the new world with cloud storage, you immediately provision the capacity you need only when you need it. So in this case, you need 400 terabytes, you deploy 400 terabytes and you only pay for 400 terabytes. And with the pay-as-you-go pricing model, when you're done, you delete your data if you need to, and you don't pay for the data that you're not storing anymore. So for bursting workloads or, or companies, I mean, Theory's gonna go into detail on how this works for them, it really enables you to do things that you couldn't do before on-prem. And again, if you take that money, instead of buying capacity and buying um, tech, I mean, you know, hardware, take that money and invest in creative talent for a company instead of hardware. When we look at storage capacity planning on the cloud, with EBS, you pay for what's provisioned. So the way I like to think of this is like renting a storage facility. 
If you fill the whole space or not, you pay for what's, what's provisioned in that facility. But with elastic volumes, it's really easy to be able to start, change your block disk as you need to. EFS, you pay for the amount of storage that's used, and same for S3. You only pay for what's used with no minimum fees. With compute, the old world, same, negotiating with vendors. You have to provision for your peak crunch times. And either rent or purchase compute as you need to for your project, which may or may not be easy depending on colo environments, how much power you can draw. Um, it's really rolling the dice as you scale out. With, again, the new world in the cloud, you provision it when you need it, you pay for it when you use it only, you scale up and down as you need to, and AWS handles the undifferentiated heavy lifting so you can focus, again, on your core business. And it's scalable any size. There's no considerations about scaling your network or storage out for this. So again, invest in your creative talent and not cloud. When we look at benchmarking, it's really important to leverage the most inexpensive ways to get things done. So in this case, we're looking at doing a 4K transcode on FFmpeg. We're looking at the differences between using a GP2 SSD-backed volume at one terabyte size versus the ST1 volume. The cost is 10 cents per gig per month for GP2 and oh, just a little bit more than half that, so four and a half cents per gig per month. But you can optimize your application to take advantage of this. So instead of having many reads off GP2 or off the SD1, you can load data once and process it once it's already on the instance. So in a single volume, it might not matter, but when you look at scaling this out you know, across thousands and thousands of volumes, this definitely adds up. And it's my honor to bring David from Theory Studios up. And Theory is going to talk about his um, story moving to the cloud and some details about how they delivered Man in the High Castle for Amazon. And a quick look at some of the work that Theory's done. Excellent. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is David Andrade, and I'm from Theory Studios. And today, I'm going to tell you a story. Now, before, David Green was talking a lot about the technology and the empowerment and cloud and volume. And that sounds great from a tech perspective. But from a creative perspective, what does that mean? What does that mean? And today, I'm going to tell you a human story of how our small little company was able to tackle one of the biggest shows on Amazon Prime and how the cloud was actually integral, not only to the ability to do the job, but really to the survival of our little studio. So as I said a little bit earlier, I worked on Man in the High Castle. If you don't know what happens in the show, Hitler has won World War II. The world is completely devastated. We're in 1960s New York and San Francisco, and we track a whole bunch of characters as they try to unravel the mystery of film reels being distributed that show a different world where Hitler lost World War II. Now, our friends at Barnstorm Visual Effects were the lead house, Lawson Deming, Corey Jamison. They had acquired this huge show, and they said, we need a little bit of help. We need a little bit of help to figure out some big problems. How do we create a whole bunch of assets quickly? How do we render some of these giant shots? You know, before then, we were doing things like pipey and set extensions. And I love piping, I love Silicon Valley, but now 
we had to do massive set replacements. If most of you don't know how visual effects works, let me give you a really quick little primer. There's basically a giant data center and a whole bunch of artists. The artists work night and day. The data center works 24-7 throughout the weekend, processing everything into images. Create some of the most amazing imagery that we've seen. Times can range from a handful of minutes to hours or days to render a single frame. And to do a little bit of quick math, 24 frames per second, 60 seconds per minute, typically about 30 minutes of visual effects per half hour or hour long TV show. I don't do math, but that sounds like a lot. <laughs> now, we were approached, Barnstorm, uh, with this image right here. It was supposed to be the top, most amazing season finale of season two of Man in the High Castle. I won't give away what happens if you haven't seen the show, but something amazing happens. There's a huge twist, and we're left on a cliffhanger. So the concept artist had drawn this scene and said, yeah, just make that on a TV budget, on a TV budget. And yet somehow, through research and diving through it and working in every meticulous little way, we were able to deliver this thing. But I'm not going to lie. When we got this image back in March and April, we were, we were freaking out. How's a team of 45-some people working from around the world going to tackle this huge thing? And that is an important distinction. Theory is made up of artists working from around the world. Barnstorm is made up of artists working in Burbank. Not only did we have to render a large TV show, remember, our biggest thing up to this point was Pipey. Not only did we have to render a huge show and create all these characters and effects and lighting, but half of our team worked around the world. How are we going to do it? I don't know, but we're going to find out here in this presentation. So here's the final image. We'll start from the back. This is what we turned in. And I'm really proud of this moment because it showed that we could deliver very close to what the concept artist wanted. And it was a very, very, very difficult journey. And it all begins with a dancing Nazi. <laughs> this is Rufus Sewell. He's, uh, he's the main Nazi in this TV show. Um, this was a fun little thing. We had to leverage any kind of technology. So we leveraged interns who could dance and hook them up to motion capture balls. And that's how we created a lot of the movement. But not only that, we also leveraged open source software. At Theory and at Barnstorm, we use Blender. If you don't know what Blender is, it's an open source animation software, much like Maya or Max, has GPU rendering, CPU rendering, lets you, being open source, do anything you want to it. Plus, we could spin up artists anywhere in the world because it was free, it was a light download, and it works on virtually any operating system out there. Now, Blender, in the beginning, was used to make small cartoons, short films, it had never been pushed to the level of creating these giant 4K images of massive amounts, two to three kilometer diameter little domes or giant domes that we had to create for Man in the High Castle. And this was the beginning of our journey. So we had concept art, we had modelers, we had shaders, and we put together this image. It took us six months to make this image, research and everything to get to this point. And it looks really great, right? You can see some dark details way in the back. You can see all the flags that would eventually be simulated and moving. You can see the meticulous detail in every tiny little thing. There's handlebars. There's exit signs, all the little things that you wouldn't really think of. But remember, this is CG, and we have to convince you that this really exists. So we built all of it. And let me tell you, we had to take Blender that could make cartoons and pipey and turn it into a super beast to make this kind of image, and we push it to its max. We had a developer on the line almost 24-7 because we were doing stuff that it was never intended to do. On top of that, we had to research everything. Remember, this is computer graphics. I know the word computer's in there, but really it should say computer arts because a person is involved all the way through creating artwork. So we researched everything. What did people wear in the 1960s? What did they wear in the 1940s? What kind of outfits did the Germans enjoy? What was the fashion during Hitler's reign? And we went as far as even creating all the tiny little things that you would see on a general, on a soldier, on everybody, because we had to meticulously create every tiny little piece. Now, 
think about this for a second. This set doesn't exist, and we'll look at exactly what they shot. It's just a guy and a giant blue screen, that's it. So nothing exists. The floor, the background, deep shadows, handrails. None of the people exist minus the main characters that are in the front. Even their shoes, the tiny little details, their faces, all, all CG, it's all completely fake. After a while, you're like, yeah, that looks pretty good, but you start to run into one tiny little problem. Data. Data is the biggest problem that we suffered. Not only did we have to create every tiny little asset, we also had to deal with the fact that this scene was ginormous. And to make things even better, all of our artists who were working on the CG side of things were remote. That is, not a single one worked next to each other. All the artists were virtual. We had people from Australia to Germany, throughout North America, and a handful in, in Argentina. So this created a huge bottleneck and a huge problem to solve. This scene alone, by the end of it, was about 120 gigs of different assets that had to be more or less upversioned 160 times. So someone do some math, 120 multiplied by 160, and that's a bazillion, right? And that's what we had to deal with. So we discovered that we had three main issues as a small studio. Barnstorm, in theory, had to tackle three very difficult issues. The first was artists working remotely. Why? Why do we even want that in the first place? And the simple answer is talent. See, the reality is, is some of the best artists don't want to commute four hours every morning to get to their job in Los Angeles. Some people like to afford a house and not have to take out a credit card every time to pay their rent. You know? So we found the best artists that we could from around the world. But that was a challenge because we had to find a way to integrate them into our pipeline. And remember, we're on a small TV budget here. We're not at like Lord of the Rings money, so we couldn't have just, well, we'll just send everybody a Veers and figure it all out and run fiber to their home. No, that wasn't a practicality. We had to find a way to do it affordably. Back up in security. We had to secure all the files, and on top of that, we had to back it all up because you never know what's going to happen, especially with artists working virtually. And then finally, the biggest problem, the render farm. Now, if you don't know what a render farm is, I touched on it a little bit earlier. That's that giant data center. It sits there and it processes images and it takes all the 100,000 million Nazis that were created and all their textures and all the little eyebrow textures that are there and creates beautiful imagery. And we're going to talk a little bit about render farm cost a little bit later. But right in the beginning, right as we were starting to think about how we're going to deliver this show, we had no idea. We had a small render farm in Burbank. Barnstorm had a, you know, they've been able to handle quite a few things, but how do you handle giant 4K, sometimes 16K renders with a small team? So I called somebody. His name is Uzma Chakil. If you don't know who he is, he's the global tech leader for media and entertainment at Amazon. He's a really great guy. And I was like, Uzma, we need help. <laughs> we need help right now. I don't know what we're going to do. And Uzman introduced us to the magical world of AWS. So let me lay out two things. Uh, the first is the render farm built on AWS. Remember, we had artists who were working remotely, and we had render nodes. So how do we bridge everything? So Usman talked, talked us through everything that we could try to use, R4Xs, M416s, what EFS and EBS meant? We had no idea. This is totally new education, and we had a crash course on it in a month because we had to deliver these shots in two months. So this is how we built it. We had an R4X large sitting right at the middle. We had all of our artists publishing remotely, and everything was copied up to that main server. And then we had an rsync going to each and every one of our render nodes, the NFS. To give you an idea of what this looks like a little bit bigger, each and every single render node, whether we had one or a hundred, needed to talk to the server, grab the latest data, because remember, it's not like I'm just gonna put some data on my machine and publish it and we're done. Artists have to constantly version. Every time we change the eyebrow color of Rufus, we had up version. Every time that production didn't like the shoe color of the actress, we had an up version. And that's a whole bunch of data and a whole bunch of texture sets that need to be completely written back up. And then all of those have to be copied to our render nodes. 
Now, we were pretty smart about this. We use Blender, and Blender has a lot of cool tricks, and one of them was stitching. If you don't know what stitching is, basically one machine renders one part of the image, another machine renders another part of the image, and then we have a third machine that says, come together. Now, it looks really great when it's two little JPEGs on a PowerPoint, but imagine you know, a two gigabyte multi-layer EXR stitching. Yeah, it, it, that took a while. The second problem we had to solve was the artist workflow. And at first, come on, everybody here has used things like Dropbox and Google Drive, we, we get it. You just store some files and send it back and forth, and every time someone saves, it upversions. That was a terrible solution, because we were upversioning every hour, 160 versions just for one shot. And on top of that, everything that we upversioned, for the most part, things had to be completely rewritten. We couldn't, like in, say, coding, have a diff, Everything had to be replaced. Did I change the color of her shoe? That's six more textures than it'd be written, metalness, roughness, et cetera, just to change the color of the shoe on top of just the base color. So we wrote a little app, and we call it Theory Sync. And this let all of our virtual artists synchronize what they're working on. It's pretty simple. We have a website that says this is your task and what you're associated with. That website checks against what's hosted on S3, Basically, we turn it into a folder structure there. Those are then downloaded to each artist independently. Those are the only things that we're working on, so that also helped out on the security side. It's not like every artist had access to everything. Only the senior people did. And on top of that, when the artist is done, they could just publish things back, only the things that they had worked on or upversioned. And we saved a lot of headaches, because remember, we have people from all over the world working and we're like super saturating their connections. Like we are just destroying their bandwidth. Don't even talk about Netflix. They couldn't do anything. But this way, we were able to control the bandwidth of many of these folks who were working from homes or apartments, some of the best artists we've ever worked with. We were able to leverage their talent and not kill their electricity bills. But that created its own problem throughout time, is that we still had more and more artists downloading and uploading data. So then. What we decided to do is add a few more steps. You could ignore things. Were you not working on this asset anymore? Well, you don't need to down download any new updates from it. And then on top of that, to even secure things even further, you know, encryption on AWS, it's just a button. Then, of course, we built OAuth and IAM roles on top of all of that. So now when you look at the render farm and the artist workflow, things start to make sense. Artists can publish up and down to our R4X large, they can only publish the things that they're working on, and they can even ignore certain things so they don't download everything. And then the R4X Large can just send files to render nodes, and everything is great. We could do it. Guys, we could render the hardest show we've ever worked on. We could do this. Until the client asked for changes. And then we're like, OK, that's fine. We'll just spin up more render nodes. We got this. We got this. And then they asked for more changes. So we're like, oh, well, we're running out of bandwidth on our main machine because we're spawning too many render nodes, too many instances on EC2. So we don't have enough throughput. We couldn't afford burst credits. So we'll just mirror everything. We'll mirror it all to another machine that will, on top of that, connect to even more render nodes. We got this. We got this. And we started rendering faster and iterating faster. And then the client just gave us a bazillion changes, and you know, the whole model goes out the window. So uh, these are real metrics here, <laughs> half a byte a second. This is the reality. You start to eat your gains, but as you discover the magic of AWS and working in the cloud, you really end up creating some pretty cool stuff, but you have to also be mindful of what does your budget allow and how can you maximize that throughout our render nodes. So I'm not kidding. We actually just did simple R-Syncs. I know that sounds kind of mind-blowing here. It wasn't more complicated than that. Um, we had another instance that was running, and then on top of that, sometimes a third instance. This was our infrastructure, if you will. Each time an artist did an update, it would be about a 15 to 20 minute cycle. All the other machines would grab this update. They all mounted the same way. The render nodes had no idea. And then each time the render node needed something, you could just pull it from that instance. It's pretty cool. And of course, you're probably asking, why didn't we use EFS? And simply put, EFS is amazing, but it was cost. It was simply cost. So NFS was good. It worked for what we needed, but we started to hit the maximum limits of that. But that's okay. We could deal with that. And on top of this, I know 
recently we've changed the way spot pricing works, but at the time, last October, September, November, at the time, spot pricing was also super magical for us. And there's still huge discounts, don't get me wrong, but at the exact time, we were saving like 75 to 90% on cost. Now let's talk about that. Remember, we've, we're trying to have the human version of what David Green was talking about. What are the actual implications of that? My artists could work happily. They didn't have to commute for 600 hours every morning to get to their office in LA. They could work and just focus on doing amazing work. We would find the best from anywhere. We could have a render farm. How can we afford all this stuff? Well, look at this, you know, spot. We could get 64 threads for 75% discount on their main price. And what does that actually look like? Okay, let's, let's pretend you're me and Corey last year, and you're legitimately trying to figure out how can we have the hardware, the actual bandwidth to tackle some of these shots. And you get a price quote like this. That's 22 cores with 44 threads, 256 gigs of RAM, a decent amount of storage for rendering, and it's $20,000 out the door, and that's not even factoring in cooling and where the heck I'm gonna plug the darn thing in. And I work from a home office, so my wife would kick me out of the house if she tried to plug that thing in. So these became actual real issues. How are we gonna tackle that? That is obscene. That's when we started calling Usman, and he said, I'll do it for 93 cents. And I, like, mic drop. It was amazing, 93 cents an hour and more threads. For us, in rendering, in animation, threads really, really matter. RAM also really matters. So we need a machine that has a high amount of RAM and a lot of threads. Because each and every tiny little piece of an image is gonna get broken up into a little chunk for our rendering software, Blender, to process. And if I have 64 of those threads, and I have 64 little chunks working on a 20K image, and that, it'll be done hopefully one day. So threads are amazing. And even, even if I ran this AWS machine for 24 seven, the entirety of the show, it still would work out to just 8,000 bucks for the whole year. Now, no one's gonna do that, and David touched on this a little bit earlier, but the cost of actually doing this. So here is the typical studio, right? This is typical visual effects or animation studio today. They need to buy a whole bunch of hardware, put it in some sort of data center, or host it themselves, not only on top of real estate and actual electricity, cooling costs, all of that gets ha has to be factored on top of the hardware and managing the life cycle. That's an investment of almost $4 million for 200 nodes, which is about how many we ran typically on High Castle. $4 million. Now, I won't say the budgets of Man in the High Castle, but I'm gonna tell you right now, we weren't gonna buy 200 nodes for $4 million. Instead, I offer a different solution, a virtual powered AWS studio solution where I'm gonna spend maybe $4,000 on a really nice home machine and spin up the rest on the cloud. And that's exactly how we did it. Because if we ever needed 200 nodes running concurrently, each one with 128 threads even, we could do, we could do that in a matter of minutes. And then when we're done rendering, we could just spin it all down. So if I wanted to run 200 nodes, 64 threads in this case, for an hour, that was 186 bucks. And I don't care who you are, that's amazing. It's really amazing. So this is our final workflow. This is how everything got put together. We had artists working virtually from everywhere from Argentina to the ends of Canada, Germany, Australia, working remotely, sending us amazing artwork. We had a couple of steps along the way so they didn't saturate their bandwidth. We kept things secure and encrypted at rest and at flight. Things were then sent to our main server, hosted on Amazon, of course. That was mirrored to another machine, just kept in sync with our sync. Sometimes we had a couple more, but for the most part, we ran two infrastructures the entire way. All of those went to render nodes that were quickly spinned up and spinned down as needed, as we had to create these. And then finally, we had to deliver things to the client, so we did any combination of writing them to their Dropbox, SFTP, spare deliveries, whatever the client wanted, we found a way to make it work. And hey, this is a great story, right? We're able to do the job, tiny studios, 45 people combined, able to work on the most amazing visual effects, 
the biggest show on Amazon, and we had a workflow to deliver it, and everything is gonna be okay. Except for one problem, Mother Nature. Now, in my genius, I decided to start our little animation firm in Orlando, Florida, because that's where I'm from. I left Los Angeles a few years back. I moved to Orlando. My partner stayed, he stayed. I started the company, we co-own it. He's in California, I'm in Orlando. Now he doesn't know when natural disasters happen, right? Fires, earthquakes, they can just kind of come from anywhere. Of hurricanes in Florida, if you've never lived in the Southeast, you've got five days of freaking out. There's no water, the grocery stores are empty, people are losing their minds. It's like a post-apocalypse movie you really don't want to be in every couple of weeks, especially this year. Now last year, we had this hurricane. This is Hurricane Matthew. And at the time, it was the largest, most powerful hurricane to hit in over a decade, or hit Florida in over a decade. It wasn't particularly fast or super windy. It was just slow and wide. Slow and wide. It wasn't heavy in rains either, but it was just slow and wide and had a constant wind. Now, if you don't know what any of that means, it basically means you go outside and you fly away because you're getting hit by 60 mile hour winds at all times. And then, a few minutes later, the wind changes direction because now you're getting hit by the opposite side. What that means is that we lost power. Now, home studio, artists working remotely. Think about this for a second. Let's say I started a company in Orlando, Florida, doing visual effects and animation, and we lost power. I had to shut down the office, I have to make sure my employees are safe, send them all home, or maybe they go out to shelters, or they leave the state even, and we couldn't get the job done. And you imagine explaining that to a producer on a pretty high budget TV show or something like that. Well, Mother Nature blew the company away, but give me a few more weeks and I'll you know, get, get the shot done. That it wouldn't work, not in today's competitive atmosphere. But for us, I was the only one in Orlando. Yeah, we had another one in Sarasota, but we did have to evacuate. We did lose power for a few days, and we really had like zero access to anything of our home computers. So what do we do? Well, we didn't have to do anything. I just had to pull up my phone, go on my EC2 dashboard, and make sure that my shot was rendering, and it was, and that, is the magical part of what we're talking about today. Tech aside, it's amazing. Prices aside, amazing. But the real story here is that I could deliver this shot and not freak out because all my infrastructure, my hardware, my files, the rendering, everything is up on the cloud. Me and my wife can pack the 6,000 cats that we have, hop in the car and drive home or drive to another home evacuate if we had to. We lost power, but that's okay. It's not like we needed it because everything's being done in the cloud. The client had their files delivered on time. And honestly, for them, it was none the wiser. They were able to get the shot done, delivered, and everything looked great. And that is the human story because AWS basically saved our asses. We were able to do some of the most amazing artwork and not have to freak out like there's no power at the office. So that's our story, and I always like to end on something really cool. I want to actually show you what this stuff looks like. So I'm going to play a quick video, and I'm going to see what you guys think.
Thank you, David. So a quick look ahead at what, what the future may hold for AWS and production companies using AWS. It's based on the past. So in reInvent 2015, we announced a 50 terabyte snowball. A few months after that, we came out with an 80 terabyte version, so we iterated quickly. Later that year, we announced the 100 terabyte version with Snowball Edge with compute capacities. And we listened to feedback from customers and said, yeah, that, that's cute, 100 terabytes, but how do I move petabytes to the cloud? So last year, we drove out the 100 petabyte snowmobile on stage in Andy's keynote. And it just shows we don't stop innovating on behalf of customers at AWS. So if you deploy production, allow us to do what we do best, undifferentiated heavy lifting and delivering results for customers, and focus on your business and making amazing media on the cloud. We have some other storage sessions here at reInvent, also be on YouTube, and training opportunities for hands-on labs, enterprise storage architecture, and others. With that, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming today, and have a great reInvent.